the most painful thing I think you can do to another human being is to isolate them and cut them off. That's why solitary confinement you know, is such an issue in the prisons and stuff and why it's such an effective tool also in those environments because that people will do almost anything to just not be alone. And when you're raised as Jehovah's Witness your whole life, when all of your family around you, all your friends are in that environment, when they cut you off and disfellowship you, you are put into solitary confinement. Jehovah's Witnesses are a religious organization with reportedly over 8 million members across the world. They are Bible literalists who believe in Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, and maintain that Armageddon will occur in the near future. Okay. The Watchtower Organization said in 1889 that the world organizations would cease in 1914 and that Armageddon would take place. It didn't happen in 1914, they moved it to 1918, 1925. 1975 was the last one. The organization prohibits any sexual contact outside marriage. You know, where you're not really allowed to have like any intimate physical contact with someone of the opposite sex. You get married really just so you can have sex. They prohibit holiday celebrations such as birthdays and Christmas. One time, me and like another Jadalee friend ate birthday cake at school, and then we got home and we told his mom because we felt so guilty about eating the cake. Any political action such as voting, blood transfusions in the case of a medical emergency. They have told their people they may not under any circumstances take human blood. They discourage any university education that is not in the trades. So you need just enough to go by because I mean the world's going to end anyway. And the organization has a stern stance against homosexuality. There are also restrictions on what Jehovah's Witnesses should wear, what they watch, what they read, what they listen to, and the people they should surround themselves with. I just And I just kind of went in past the entryway and, uh, and waited for him to get something. I saw his dad and his brother watching TV. And, and I remember the smells and the way it just like, it, I, I think as a kid I was like frightened of it. Like I didn't know what was in there, what to expect. While some witnesses may find solace in the organization's rigid ideology, others find it difficult to adhere to its rules, leading them to anxiety and depression. And my own doctor said, like he didn't have a single Jehovah's Witness patient that he saw that wasn't on antidepressants. Right? And that's a pretty common thing. Those feelings of anxiety and depression are compounded by the fear that breaking the rules or leaving the organization will result in them being disfellowshipped and shunned by friends and family. I never thought this could happen. I never, not in a million years, thought this could happen. You know, like, death took two of my brothers and it never broke us up the way, the way this has. Like, in such a strange way. I will be talking to former Jehovah's Witnesses about the struggles they faced being members of the organization and how their lives changed after they were disfellowshipped. If a teenager or minor is disfellowshipped, life at home can become difficult as the relationship between parent and child becomes strained. In many cases, the organization encourages parents to kick out their disfellowshipped children once they are 18 years old. I came to talk to Jody, who has a similar story. Uh, I didn't today. No breakfast. No, no breakfast today, no. He was disfellowshipped the day he finished high school after the organization discovered he had got a young woman pregnant. Being in a small town, it doesn't take long for that to get around. And, you know, I didn't tell my parents, we'll put it that way. Somebody else did. And that's because uh, Jehovah Witnesses, they're almost encouraged to rat on each other, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, they are. Yeah, they are. Police, to, to police them. Yeah, yeah. If you, it, basically they, what they tell you is if you've seen somebody do something and you didn't do anything about it, you are just as guilty in Jehovah's eyes mm -hmm. by not doing the right thing and uh, informing the elders. So when you got this girl pregnant, um, your parents find out, right? Well, how does that conversation go? Just my mom was home, and when I got there, she basically informed me that uh, I needed to go to what they call a judicial meeting. So I went, and uh, it went exactly how I expected it to. My dad wasn't home at the time. So uh, it might have taken less than an hour, you know, and they made that decision for the good of the congregation that they were going to disfellowship me. And uh, they announced it right away, you know, that I was disfellowshipped from the, from the congregation and people should avoid, you know, they, in front of the whole congregation, that people should avoid contact with me and 
you know, and uh, they gave the reason why, you know, and everybody, like I said, turned around and looked and... Uh. How did you feel in that it's, moment? Uh, pretty small at that moment. Like, I knew these people my whole life. And within that second, they were never going to speak to me again. And they never did. None of them. You know, the, the boys in the congregation that were close to my age that I had grown up with, I mean, that was the last time that I talked to them. That was it. You know, uh, next day at school, or it was nothing. Like, it was like I didn't even exist anymore. And uh, things changed at home, too, obviously. I mean, my parents, uh, minimal communication. No more good morning, no more nothing. I mean, it was just minimal. Because from what I can understand is that you got disfellowshipped in January and then they yeah. said you had this, you had yeah. until you graduated until to. Until graduated school, yeah. So uh, that you, conversation took place right away. So within uh, a day or two, my dad returned home from, from work. Uh, uh, we sat down. I expected, honestly, I expected to be booted out right there. I, my dad said he would allow me to stay as long as I attended the meetings. I could no longer go out and field service because you're not allowed to, obviously. When you're, but I had to attend the meetings. If I didn't, that was it. That was out. So I was allowed to stay there until I finished high school. So, and literally the day I finished high school, that was... Can you talk about that? That was it. Yeah, it was a pretty shitty day for me. Pretty shitty day, man. I can remember my stuff being outside and... And uh, my mom, I still can see her standing in, in the front window and just pointing at the road. You know, a uh, couple bags sitting outside and that was it. I had no money. I had nothing, you know. Nothing. I had my, uh, my little Honda Civic car. I had maybe a quarter tank of gas in it. And uh, that was it. You know, I um, I got into my car, and uh, when we were kids, we used to hang out under a bridge, and uh, I went there. And under the bridge, we had like a, not a cabin, but a little setup there, right? So I um, I spent the night there. Actually, I had slept there for a couple days, and those couple days, I was very close to to ending it. You know, it definitely crossed my mind on several occasions and rather quickly. I didn't know what to do. I mean, you're just, just a young kid. You no longer have a support network of any kind. I didn't really know. I knew some kids from school. I was friends with some kids, but not very many. Because nobody really wanted to associate with you or a Jehovah's Witness. You were, you were not like the other kids, right? So... Yeah, it was, um... I wouldn't say the lowest point of my life. That came later on, but I'd say it's pretty close, man. It's pretty close. It still still burns me. You know that you know, the doors are locked and you're not welcome here anymore. Do you think it was difficult for your parents to do that? No. I don't. They were that immersed. In the, in the Jehovah's Witnesses at that time, that I broke the rules, that's what happens. You know, that's what needs to be done. He needs to be, we're done with him. Mm -hmm. So unless you want to come back to Jehovah, you're, we're done. How difficult were those initial years of being alone? Oh... Well, made a lot more difficult by uh, by alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. I mean, that's that's definitely what I turned to. What do you think alcohol and drugs did for you? It, well, 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 in hindsight, it didn't do anything. That but moment. <clears throat> it dulled it out. You know, I mean, the bottle was my friend. I, you know, I, you could get drunk and you could forget about everything, or you can get stoned and, and just not care. And and then it became an everyday thing. That's just how I functioned. You know. I did for the longest for the longest time. I did. It just washed it all away, and uh, eventually, 
I put it so far down, I stopped. I stopped thinking about it. It probably took five or six years for me to stop thinking about wondering where what they were doing or 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 if they even cared about me, which is weighed on my mind quite a bit. I mean, you were abandoned by your parents. And then I just got to that tipping point where I just, no, I just didn't care anymore. How long did it take you to reconnect with your family? 2011. So from 1989 or 1990, early 1990. It's almost 20 years. Yeah. 2011. And I have seen them three times since then. What was that first interaction like? It was weird. It was weird. It was uh, it's like meeting strangers. You know, I didn't know them. Did they ever actually apologize to you? Not really. No, sort of. Like I said, my mom sort of made some awkward conversation that we had the first time I went there about the way she wishes things had went differently or or something along those lines, and uh, and that was it. You know, I got. Uh, I got no love for them anymore. I don't. I mean, uh, I mean, even my sisters. I don't even know them. You know, I talk to my youngest sister once in a while, but the other two, I, I couldn't even tell you where they live. I know whereabouts they live, but that's about it. Do the tattoos on your body? Do they represent like uh, what you went sure. through? Sure, everything does. Um, I was uh, lost without a sense of direction for. For a long time, and I um, self-abused for a long time, you know, and uh, um, for me, like, my, my life was complete anarchy. I was always, I always felt that for, for the longest time, that I was all by myself, which I, which I, I wasn't, you know, that's just something that I thought. You know, it was something that was beat into me. And if you leave Jehovah's Organization, you're going to be on your own. And I always thought that I was, you know, and I was lost without a sense of direction for a long time until I, I was lucky enough to meet my wife, and you know, she put me on the straight and narrow. And I mean, I can, uh, I'll give her a hundred percent credit as to why I'm sitting here right now. I mean, I'm not sure where I, where I would be. My life was still in a fog when I first met her, and for some reason she saw something in me that, that I didn't see in myself, and uh, I owe her. I owe her my life, basically, right? Yeah. You know, and having my daughter is just a bonus. It is, you know. And I have even more reason to to keep going and, and, uh, and try to do better for myself, right? So... Well, tomorrow's another day. I came to sit and talk with Jan. Hi. Hi, Jan. How's it going? Come on in. She had been a Jehovah's Hi. Witness for 23 years. As a teenager, she experienced verbal abuse from an elder and his wife. Later in life, she was disfellowshipped because of the actions she took in the hopes of divorcing her ex-husband. There was a situation, an elder and his wife, both full-time pioneer ministers, um, were rather abusive to people in the congregation um, on an emotional, um, verbal spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think I took it harder than other people simply because at the time I was already suffering an undiagnosed mental illness. Um, and being a teenager is always tough. You take things far too personally and you're just trying to figure out who you are. Um, so because of it, I had a really rough go, um, with my mental health. And before I was 17 inclusive, um, I attempted suicide three times. The first two times I don't think my parents knew about. Mm. Um, but the third time I ended up in the hospital. How did you go about attempting suicide? It was, it was always uh, overdosing on things that were already in the house. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the last time I purposely went out to the pharmacy um, to make sure that I had enough. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and at the time I was also self-harming as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so in, in retrospect, I know for a fact that it, it wasn't that I actually wanted to end my life. Um, but I just, I wanted the situation to be, to be done. And I, I didn't want to deal with the pain anymore. Did you ever tell your parents about the verbal abuse from this elder? They knew. Um, they knew that it had been going on, as did other people in the congregation from what I gathered of casual, casual conversations with people. Um, but I don't, I don't think people kind of realized how bad it could get. Um, and it was, it was always sort of brushed off because this couple was um, an elder pioneer couple and they had ties with um, people higher up in the organization. Um, so they were kind of, they were seen as exemplary, um, almost as if they could do no wrong. So there was um, no disciplinary, uh, disciplinary actions towards the elder or the wife? No. Um, years after it had happened, when I finally was able to talk about it, um, more so in public, I did approach the, the elders in my new congregation regarding what had happened. And um, unfortunately, because there weren't two witnesses to any of this, it was just me, um, they weren't able to do anything. They essentially said, there's nothing we can do. Um, the, the only thing that we can do is leave it in Jehovah's hands. At that, at that period, when you're going through um, these bouts of depression, were you always still a strict Jehovah? Like was, or were you starting to doubt yourself at that time? I think the, um, the abuse made me doubt it, but I thought that it was because I was somehow deficient spiritually. And that's why I was always down all the time. That's why I was always so negative. Um, so when I moved to Edmonton, I, I thought it was like a new beginning. It was a new congregation, new set of brothers and sisters. Um, it'll be a lot better. Um, and it was for a while, um, but then things started creeping up in the back of my head, doubts, questions about why things are the way that they are within the organization. Um, and then eventually it was, I think it was my marriage um, to a Jehovah's Witness brother that, that really was the, the last straw for me. How old were you when you got married? I was 19. Did you hope that get, um, getting married was going to be like a new chapter in your life? Like an, almost an, it would bring you some sort of happiness that maybe you were missing before? I almost felt obligated to get married because we had been seeing each other for several months. And in the back of my head, I knew that it wasn't working out. Um, but there is an unspoken stigma that if you don't follow through, especially after several months of seeing each other, um, that there's there's something wrong, that you're looking to get married for the wrong reasons. Um, so it it generally is expected that you'll you'll get married. During that period when you guys are sort of seeing each other, mm -hmm. there's obviously no sexual touching or anything. Is but uh, kissing is fine. I find it is highly dependent on the congregation that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, some places are more liberal and some are more conservative. Um, but generally the rule of thumb is don't do anything that could get you carried away. Um, so as for us, like we didn't, we rarely kissed. Um, we weren't allowed to be alone at any time with each other. Um, yeah, so it was, it's very strict. Never allowed to be alone. Yeah, so always we like always had chaperones. Really? Yeah. Wow. So during that seven month period, do the elders and organization, are they like questioning you? Are they in the sense of what are you doing or are they encouraging you to get married? Um, so they, they essentially want to make sure that your intentions are good, that, you know, you're not just dating person after person after person, but they also want to make sure that um, the organization, the congregation is has a good standing, a good reputation. Um, so they'll make sure that, you know, you haven't done anything that'll bring reproach to them. Um, 
And also, if you're planning on getting married inside the Kingdom Hall, place of worship for Jehovah's Witnesses, um, which is highly encouraged, mm -hmm. um, the brother who is going to give the, um, the marriage sermon will ask you very directly if you've done any sexual activity or um, anything that he might not be then comfortable with giving the talk. Why do you think they get so invasive with your sex life? They they say that it's to maintain the like the purity of the the marriage arrangement and the purity of the congregation. Um, I think it does come down to control, though, um, because overall they are quite controlling in people's in people's lives. And sexuality is a form of personal expression, and they try to hinder that as much as possible, mm -hmm. even in private matters like that like sex like do you feel trapped in a sense because divorce is discouraged within the organization as mm -hmm. well the only scriptural reason for divorce um would be adultery cheating on your on your spouse your partner um and like if you talk to other other sisters they all have very similar stories um at the time i thought that was the only way to get out of my marriage because i was frantically desperate trying to get out um so that's what i ended up doing and the the majority of xjw women that i've talked to have done the same thing so after the whole scenario happens like uh do you, you go up in front of a judicial committee mm -hmm. right correct and how many elders are there so the process is that initially there will be two elders mm -hmm. Um, to investigate whether or not a judicial committee needs to be formed. Um, and then the actual judicial committee is um, three brothers. But in, in my case, they, they asked me, you know, was it one time that you had sex with this person? Was it multiple times? Um, are you still in contact with them? Um, they also asked if we used birth control. Um, they also asked if I had an orgasm, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, um, because apparently that indicates if I really wanted to do it or not. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, overall, it was very invasive. And afterwards, um, once they've gathered all that information, um, you're asked to leave the room and then you'll be called back in with a decision. Um, my decision took about 15 minutes or so, um, which... It felt like a long time, but when you think about it, isn't that long considering that you're, you're essentially handing out that person to be shunned from their friends and their family. And your mother has stopped talking to you because you're disfellowshipped, right? Yeah. Is that tough? It's very odd knowing that your mother supposedly cares for you. At least I'd like to think that she does or that she did at one point. Um, but she doesn't talk to you anymore or come to visit you or, you know, even send you cards in the mail. And you are their only child, right? Yeah, correct. Wow. Yeah. And my, my mom is also an only child. Um, so my maternal grandmother, I'm her only grandkid. It's just, wow. It's... It's more impactful, I think, like you're the only child and they're still able to stop. Your mom's completely able to cut you off like that. Is she is still a strong believer, you think? No? No, I don't think so. Why do you think she's not attempted to make contact with you anymore? I do think it's because of their parents. Um, all of my grandparents are still alive. And it sounds bad but i think it'll be a lot easier for my mom and dad when my grandparents die because they my parents are being held in by them and if you know if they stop um believing or if they start talking to me then they'll be cut off by their parents For other Jehovah's Witnesses, the roles are reversed, and it's a parent who is disfellowshipped, leaving them unable to communicate openly with their children. I had come to see Nash and his fiancée Lisa. That's how I feel too in front of the 
Nash had been a Jehovah's Witness for 36 years and raised his children in the organization before he was disfellowshipped twice, once in 2015 and again in 2016, both times related to drinking. After leaving the organization, Nash and his ex-wife separated, but she remained a Jehovah's Witness along with their children. Because your kids are still Jehovah's Witnesses, how has that affected your guys' relationship? Yeah, it's really difficult, Like, uh, especially since I took a pretty hard stand now um, against the witnesses and everything involved. And uh, so, like, my oldest daughter had her 10th birthday in December, and so I bought her just a few little gifts, nothing special, but, like, a nice little necklace and stuff um, with a saying on it that, that I used to say to her, and, and, uh, and she won't wear it. Um, it's in a box in her room, she said, but she doesn't want to wear it because it was a birthday present. Uh, my oldest boy, I, I don't know, he's a hard one to crack. He's 15 now, and... Uh, like I haven't really spent any real time with him in over a year. And while we still talk and everything seems fine, you know, we just don't get to ever see each other. And I can tell it's that he has just a lot of pressure on him. I mean, there's a lot of things going on, but he definitely has a lot of pressure on him just to not be around me. Like, are your kids disappointed in you that you're not Jehovah's Witness? Like, have they said anything to you like that? Yeah, Eden did, my oldest daughter. Um, we were just at the pool getting ready to go in. And uh, she said to me, Dad, you made the worst decision in your life. And I, I said, what do you mean? And she says, you left Jehovah. And I said, well, honey, I didn't, I didn't leave Jehovah. I just said, I'm not going to be a Jehovah's Witness anymore. She says, I think you just made the worst decision in your life. And that was, just, that was it. That's what she had to say. How old is she? Uh, she was nine then. It's just, it's, it's interesting having his kids over and seeing, seeing already, like, so young how dedicated they are to it when even talking about birthdays we were talking about birthdays the other day when they were here and his youngest was just as soon as we started talking about them i don't like birthdays i don't like cake i don't like presents like the way my kids act when other witnesses around and the way they treat me like the way that other people treat me and my kids just feel like that's okay i went uh, i think my kids played hockey at the rink with the jehovah's witnesses I met them at Dairy Queen to take them for ice cream after. Um, and I walked in and I had all four of my kids with me. And there were some of the witnesses from hockey sitting there. They just played with my, my boys. And uh, we were behind them. So they were sitting down eating their food. I came in and ordered and we were getting drinks behind them. And they all sat there. And these are some of them are my oldest boy's friends, same age. And none of them talked to my kids. None of them said hello. None of them turned around from their seats. And we were this far away. And nobody did anything. And these are people like that I've known for years. And they're still friends with my kids, supposedly. Mm -hmm. And they just treated them like they weren't there. And my kids didn't think anything of it. You know, like, it, we just have to take it. Just be like, just take it. And people say that. Why does a nation just go away quietly? Just go quietly. Like, why do you have to say anything? But the reality is, the only reason I speak out against it is because my kids are still stuck in it. Mm -hmm. And because they're taking my friends and family. And they took them. I think that they feel like they have more entitlement to your kids than you do for sure they because do. they feel like like that is for sure the i don't know the sense that i get well because it's they the reality feel like they're gonna save they're gonna save his kids so we're gonna keep them and we're gonna save them it's their eternal from, their eternal future yeah because i'm just gonna live this life now mm -hmm. they're gonna live a whole forever before he was disfellowshipped nash owned a home building company with his father and his brothers in 2011 nash came to work to find that his brother jared had committed suicide he had hung himself in the job shack. Do you think Jared, when he committed suicide, did he go away believing in Jehovah still? Like, do you think he believed that he would be resurrected or he was uh, just in so much pain and didn't even... I don't know. I printed off his letter, actually. Oh. Yeah, and I... Okay. Yeah, just underneath there. Um, he says uh, to his kids, he says, stand behind your mother. Support her decisions to make your family better. Most important, love the one who created you, Jehovah. Do not allow your mind to be filled with the filth and badness of this sick world. You'll never forgive yourself if you do. You need the truth more than you know. Great things will become of all of you. You will see the new world. You might think what I did was weak, and you were right. What I did was horrible, but I know you will get through, so I ask you to forget me. Do not hold on to anything that reminds you of me. Look to the future for your strength, to your loving Heavenly Father. Pray to Him as I should have. Build a strong bond with him and your energy and inner soul will be pure and strong. 
able to get through anything, especially this. The pains that I felt physically every day are far easier to deal with than the pains I feel in my heart. Every time we go to the meetings and the kids ask why I don't comment or go on service, I know you feel the same pain in your heart, so let it go. Let the pain go with me, progress spiritually. Don't allow others to get in your way. Allow them to help you, but be firm in your mind and heart that love for your creator is most important and you will succeed. Thank Jehovah every day for your precious life he has given you. I have not shown that appreciation. I've gone too far. My heart is now black and must pass on. While I fade away, you become better. You are free. No longer will you worry or wonder about me. The life Jehovah has given me, I have abused. I am not worthy of it, and I am not prepared to drag you down with me. This is not your fault. You are the only and best thing that has ever happened to me. I do this for you. Free yourselves of me. Forget me. I love you. So, like for me, I'm, I don't know. It's weird because uh, when I read that originally, I never, it never hit me the same way um, as it does now. Like the, like how much he felt like it was still the truth. Like he felt that this was, he was done. Like, and that's why I think there's so many people that are uh, in such dire straits that were raised witnesses or, or still are. Um, because there's no worse feeling than, than thinking I can't do this, but there's nothing else. Because mm -hmm. I know when I was done and I was leaving and it was over, I still thought they were right. I still thought there's no way in hell I'm going to make it. Like I'm, I'm going to make this choice because this is best for me and I know this is better. But, but I'm dead. And that's what he went out thinking that this is there's no there's no point in being here. So I'm just hurting everybody I'm here with mm. and I'm going to bring them down with me. Cause especially when you're the dad and the, you know, the head, you're the head of the house. And so your kids, like if Armageddon came, like what they believe is if Armageddon came tomorrow and, uh, and I was with my ex-wife and my kids and I wasn't doing anything, um, my kids would die with me. That's just cause none of them are baptized. And, and so that's how he felt. Well, that line where he says he's he feels like he's left Jehovah let Jehovah down. Like, what what is he talking about there? Those feelings of guilt and shame that he had all the time over not being good enough mm -hmm. that stemmed from from this religion because those are our beliefs. Like, you're never good enough. Like, you're always you're always falling short. And they're like, well, if you just try, eventually a paradise will come and, and it'll all be fixed. <laughs> it's like, but that's not good enough because you never you never work on yourself. Now you never you never figure out how to feel good enough as a dad, as a husband, and as a person for yourself. And so you just had this turmoil all the time. Everyone I've interviewed, their families are completely broken. Mm -hmm. Completely. It's sad seeing that from the outside because I think without the interference of the Jehovah's Witnesses, I think all, all these families would still be intact. It's so inhumane and uh, and unnatural to to want to cut your family off to just think that this is the only way this is the best thing because they honestly think that they're doing the best thing for me mm -hmm. and for themselves and i know they aren't bad people i love my family to death and i know that in no way are they trying to hurt me that's not their plan they think they honestly think that they're doing what's right and they're just like well maybe one day he'll he'll wake up and and uh, and come back and, and that's insane to think because, you know, finally being out now, I'm, now I'm finally awake. Like I finally know what's going on. And, and I don't know, like, that's the thing. I don't have all the answers anymore. Whereas before I thought I had all the answers. I knew it all. I, I knew what was going to happen when I died. I knew what happened to everybody else when they died. I knew where we were all going. I knew who was going to heaven and who was going to be on earth. And it was good and everything was figured out. And so to be in a spot where you don't know, uh, it's weird. Like the whole world is different to me. And, uh, and I've had people say to me, like, you know, don't be so hopeless. Like you can't be hopeless like that, but I'm not hopeless anymore. Like in reality, I finally actually have some hope in life because I can control right now. I feel responsible for myself right now for what I do, how I treat people. Um, and for the rest of my life, the rest of the life that I know of anyway. And if there's something after this life, then that's great. I hope I get there, but I don't know. And I know for certain that having 
you know, a shaved face and, and, and wearing a, a suit on Sunday, that's not going to get me there. Like that, none of that stuff matters. And it's like, you got, so, you were so just, and go, like just all encompassed with that. You're just surrounded by this crazy little nitpicking of your life. The things you said, the things you did, the things you thought. And, and that just, that took over everything. And, and it's like, it kept you so busy that just life is passing you by. I was with Mike, who had been a Jehovah's Witness for almost 40 years and is currently an inactive member. In his early 20s, Mike found himself in a difficult marriage. Through the entirety of their relationship, Mike and his wife never had intercourse. His marriage had left him feeling trapped and suicidal. In a marriage, the only thing that really provides grounds for, you know, a divorce and then marrying somebody else is basically if somebody dies or if one spouse spouse is unfaithful, right? And has sex with somebody else. You know, we were fighting quite a bit of the time. I was miserable all the time. I just got to the point where I just couldn't, I couldn't deal. You know, I just kept packing all of this stuff down. I, you know, started looking at porn and was like doing that all the time and then feeling super guilty about that. Cause that was like a big, you know, no, no. And so that just ate away at me. And I mean, that, you know, I went probably like from being, you know, I'd consider a relatively kind of happy guy, you know, before getting married to by the end of it, like, you know, I, I thought, you know, the, the only way really out of this marriage was somebody had to die. Right. So then it turned to like self murder. Like, how can I kill myself? And that led to eventually an attempt. Right. It's so interesting, like you feel so trapped in this marriage, right? And you only, the only way you see out is that you, you think, okay, I'm just going to attempt suicide. I'm just going to attempt to kill myself, assuming that you're going to go to paradise after, right? Can you take me back to that day of when you thought, okay, this is the day I'm going to attempt suicide. Like what was going through your mind? Yeah. I mean, my... Direct memories are pretty hazy because at that point you're in kind of a messed up place. But I do remember just thinking this was the most logical thing to do. This just made the most sense. This had the best possible outcome for everybody, right? It was in this scenario. That's how I kind of rationalized it or justified it in my mind. You know, I had access to mostly like codeine right was the big one so i had you know a fair substantial supply of that and thought if i could mix that with basically any other kind of drugs that i might have you know cold medication all that i just swallowed basically like you know a glass full of pills i think and just hoped that you know i wouldn't wake up you know from this I had some sleeping pills in there too But I did. I mean, I woke up probably like 20 hours later, felt horribly sick. Like I should have gone to a hospital. I should have gone, you know, had a mentalist, like a psych assessment and all that stuff. But I didn't. And I just kind of played it off as I had a flu for like a couple weeks. And it was kind of after that, then realizing like, listen, like I pretty sure you know if you're at the point where you're going to kill yourself you know god should understand if that isn't working and you can separate and that's kind of how i justified it right like if this had made me so miserable that this wasn't going to work out even though this isn't really allowed and it should probably you know stick in the marriage i think god would be understanding in this case i'd finally just worked up the courage to just say no we've got to end this but it wasn't maybe like two hours after she had left. And then I had a knock on the door and it's a couple elders that are like, you know, want to get to the bottom of this and tell me, you know, you need to go and get your wife and, you know, fit this all together. And I said, listen, I mean, I got to the point here. I was going to kill myself. I am not getting back together with her. I, this just isn't going to work for me. And they're like, oh, that's just a cop out. Right? Like in just completely like dismissed it and blew it away. There was nothing like, oh, 
maybe you need some help, right? Maybe you need to go see a psychiatrist, a therapist or something. There was none of that, right? And there was no meaningful help that they gave to really address, you know, what those issues were. And so eventually they left. I went away and saw my parents for a couple of days and then came back. And then it was just this continuous onslaught of meetings with elders trying to get you know, us to get back together and try to get to the bottom of things. And that went on for a couple of months. And, you know, it was through that whole time then that I started to develop a much closer relationship with the person who then became my wife eventually again. And so that relationship kind of started to develop. And so then when all of this stuff had blown up and I was now, you know, separated, but just feeling completely alone, you know, reached out more closely. We, you know, started seeing each other on the down low, you know, like away from anybody's prying eyes. So we kind of had this secret relationship going on for a while. Um, and it got a little bit intimate, like we still didn't have, you know, sex, but we were, you know, doing some other things that made my wife then, well, became my wife, but I guess girlfriend then very, um, feeling very guilty. She needed to go and confess to the elders. So I had to go and confess to the elders. And then that started this whole judicial process of, okay, now you've, you've really broken the rules here. This is stuff that you can't do. So we need to have this judicial committee where they determine, are you sufficiently repentant so that we don't have to disfellowship you or, you know, are you doing what you don't need to? They initially decided that I was repentant enough. And then when my first wife found out about that, she caused a big sting, said some stuff that I think was mostly made up, got them to reconsider. And so then they decided to disfellowship me. So I had this kind of up and down roller coaster that went on for a couple of months. What kind of questions did they ask you at the judicial meeting? You know, were you touching each other's genitals? Were you like stroking each other? How much were you doing it? How long were you doing it? You know, how many times did you do it? You know, on what days were you doing it? What times and what setting was that happening? You know, did you orgasm? Like all these super explicit details. It's like you they wanted to play by play, right? Of everything that you did. And you know, at the time I just gave them all this info, right? And it's just like, oh yeah, okay. That was this, 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 and this. And I look back now and it's like, this is none of your business, right? Like this is so invasive. This is crossing so many boundaries. When you, after you got disfellowshipped, you obviously went back. Was it a, was a big reason the fear of just losing all your community and your social bonds with friends and family? Yeah, it became a harsh reality. And because, you know, especially all my family, you know, were Jehovah's Witnesses, it just felt like I have to get back in, right? Because I can't not have this ability to have relationships with all my family. My brother-in-law, who was a ministerial servant, was removed because they didn't immediately kick me out of their house when I was disfellowship. So there were consequences for the people that I think kept contact. And that's, you know, a good way to keep those people in line with all the rules as well and enforce this as well. If you're going to talk like it, you can be disfellowship for having a relationship, like even a family relationship with somebody who's disfellowship. So after being reinstated as a Jehovah's Witness, Mike married his girlfriend, but he had doubts about the truthfulness of the organization and used alcohol to suppress his skepticism. You know, for me, it found like it may sound silly to some people, but for me, it was Noah's flood, right? I mean, as a Jehovah's Witness, you have to believe that that flood happened. And when that was just so demonstrably false, that was kind of like one. And it, that was a challenge for me. It's like, well, how do I square this, right? And I was starting to come up with all these weird kind of theories on my own about how, well, maybe it's okay, you know, that the flood didn't happen, or maybe there's some other stories. You know, I was coming up with all these weird justifications and doing all these mental gymnastics to support it but the answers were never satisfying it was scary because the ramifications of finding out it's not true you know well at that point you're likely going to lose all your friends and family right so that's a pretty big devastating thing and so i just found ways to suppress those doubts or get rid of them 
for me, like drinking was a good one because it was just like, okay, I don't want to have to worry about this. So let's drink a bit and it kind of goes away and just tried to shut out any of that kind of stuff and just forge ahead. But, you know, eventually like it was getting to a point where clearly, you know, drinking to solve these issues was not a healthy thing to go through. You know, I was depressed and anxious about everything. And it's like, okay, I really need to sort this out for myself. Um, my wife and I were thinking about having a child and I just knew at that point, even though I was still, so it's like, I could not raise a child as a Jehovah's Witness. I do not want them to have that experience that I went through. And I just, I got to figure this out, right? Because I can't go any further. And so then I finally allowed myself to take in information from other sources. And it did turn out, I mean, to really deal with the depression, anxiety, drinking and all that stuff, I had to get out. And once I did, you know, and that's only been, you know, the last couple of years, it was still rocky to get going. But like, yeah, it took getting out of that leaving it behind, just realizing that, okay, those friends are probably gone forever. I'm not going to have the relationship with my family that I would have wanted or would expect and just have accepted that, that now it's like, okay, I can move on. You know, I don't feel like everything's hopeless. There's things in life that I want to live for. Like you're in a, you're in a good place now, but probably those first I don't know, year, couple of months, would you say you were, you felt alone? Like very lonely? Yeah, I felt like completely alone. I had this experience which made it very surreal for me. So I joined a jujitsu club and I've been doing that now for a couple of years. And you know, you get in and you need to sign like a form, right? And you need to put an emergency contact, right? And it was at that point, it was, I have nobody, right? There's nobody that I could put on that column to call, right? And so I, I think it's still the case. I should update it. My emergency contact was 911, right? The the organization put so had so many strict rules and you found them so difficult to follow, just not being able to read other material or the way you dress, all that stuff. But there are 8 million Jehovah Witnesses in the world, right? Supposedly. Mm -hmm. So both of them, I guess, are fine with those strict rules. When you really understand to the level that Jehovah's Witnesses are micromanaged in every aspect of their life and how controlled they are, even though they'll say that they're not and they have all their personal freedoms, you don't. Like you are so controlled and so micromanaged. It, it literally is like, you know, they talk so much about, oh, the new system coming in paradise. Like it, it's actually here, right? You're, you're just trapped in purgatory right now. You're trapped in hell get out of there and you can actually have, you know, some joy and happiness, right? And get that out of your life before it's too late. The, the saddest part is all these people are putting off having a happy life for some future paradise to come.